Okay, we are online. Um, hello, community. Hello, Scott and Mike. Thank you for joining me today for this interview. <clears throat> My name is Alex. I'm running the Black Mountain Analysis blog, and today uh, we will go with Scott and Mike through the recent developments in Ukraine. Uh, my readers know Scott and Mike very well. That's why I will go. I uh, will do a brief introduction today. Scott is part of very important historic events. He helped to implement the, the IMF treaty back in the uh, 80s uh, as a weapons inspector, and he's a proud Marine, a former artillery and intelligence officer, and he was the UN chief weapons inspector in Iraq. Uh, with his Waging Peace initiative, he continues to contribute his part for a collaboration between the nations and for arms control. Thank you, Scott, for being here. Uh, Mike is a former Serbian and Canadian military officer and engineer. He left the army with the rank of a captain. Uh, he served in air defense, artillery and intelligence units. Moreover, he is the author of several military books and he's also an author on Black Mountain Analysis. Uh, thank you for being here, Mike. Yeah, so let's start with the questions. Um, I would say let's start uh, to talk about the elephant in the room, the Kerch Bridge. Uh, it happened again. The bridge was somehow bombed and damaged. Civilians lost their life. I'd like to ask both of you um, initially about your overall assessment um, about what happened and what are the implications. Scott, could you start with your general assessment what actually happened? Well, I mean, it happened this morning, so uh, <laughs> we're still in the information collection uh, realm, but um, it appears uh, that Ukraine used um, some sort of underwater drone, a lot of speculation about a British, a particular mm -hmm. British uh, drone that was used, uh, packed with uh, explosive, an increased amount of explosives, um, and that this was used to attack the uh, the bridge. And it uh, it dropped a, um, a span, um, the part of the the, uh, the the road traffic side. There's, uh, there's two lanes, it dropped one of the lanes. The other one, I guess, is damaged, but still uh, yeah. up. Um, but it didn't take down the rail line. And, and that that's important because what we're dealing with here is um, what is the purpose of this? Let me start off by saying that um, there's no one that can tell me that this isn't a legitimate military target. It's a strategic line of communication. Uh, Russia uses it to uh, supply, um, you know, it, it, its militaries in Crimea and move those supplies into uh, Kherson and Zaporizhia. So there's people out there saying that this is a war crime because. Uh, you know, it's it, it shouldn't have been struck. No, there's no war crime here. And about the civilians that died, look, I'm sorry for the 14 year old girl. She lost her parents. Uh, they are innocent victims in this. Um, they shouldn't, it, 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 this shouldn't have happened, but it did. I mean, we can't pretend that Russia's not at war. Russia can call it a special military operation, um, but both Russia and Ukraine have rightly said this is a war for their existential survival. Neither side can afford to lose. And Ukraine is losing and losing badly right now. And so we're seeing them right. basically engage in increasing acts of desperation. And this one will backfire. Uh, even if they drop the whole bridge, it's not, it doesn't change the outcome. It can complicate Russian logistics, et cetera, but it won't change the outcome. Russia's going to win this war. Um, the, the, the other thing is, you know, this is the second attack. The first attack uh, led to the initiation of a major air campaign run by Russia against uh, Ukrainian energy infrastructure, where they took out 50 to 60% of, of Ukraine's uh, energy infrastructure. And then Russia stopped because they made their point that if you attack strategic targets, we will take out strategic targets. I can't tell you what the Russian response will be, um, but there will be a Russian response and it will be strategic in nature. Uh, then they will inflict far more pain on the Ukrainians and the Ukrainians inflicted on the Russians, but this is part of a larger picture here. Um, I think one of the things the Ukrainians are hoping that happens, because this the timing of this attack is linked, I believe, to the termination of the grain uh, deal. Um, and I think what the Ukrainians are trying to do is provoke a Russian attack on Odessa, to provoke a Russian attack that seeks to close down Odessa as a um, as a viable port. Uh, for the exportation of grain. 
uh, Ukraine is trying to create a global food crisis, a food emergency, uh, put billions of people's lives at risk, or at least perceived at risk, uh, to create a global emergency of such a scope and scale that the international community must intervene, must intervene, um, and hopefully intervene in a way that brings termination to the conflict while Ukraine still has something that can be called Ukraine. Uh, because the trajectory of this conflict is going decisively against Ukraine. Uh, their counteroffensive is, is, is spent. They, there's little bursts. It's like if I sever an artery, there's going to be some bleeding coming out. But that doesn't mean that you're doing okay. It just means <laughs> bleeding out. And so Ukraine, I believe, is bleeding out on the battlefield. Um, mm -hmm. The Russians have yet to commit their the bulk of their strategic reserves that they built up just for the special military operation. Depending on whose number you use, 180, 220,000, who knows? It's a lot. It's a lot more yeah. than what Ukraine has. They're equipped, they're organized, they're trained, they have logistical sustainability, and they have yet to be committed. And when they are committed, it'll be done at a time and a place where Ukraine has expended its strength and Russia will be able to rapidly achieve whatever physical objectives they set out for themselves. Uh, but it all adds up to the destruction of the Ukrainian armed forces and the strategic defeat of Ukraine. Time is not on Ukraine's side. So we've seen them. I, I think this is this attack on the bridge is an effort to trigger a Russian response that then Ukraine can use together with its allies because Ukraine doesn't operate by itself. Let's understand if this was a yeah. British drone, mm -hmm. this was an yeah. attack carried out by Britain. Uh, this is drone this is an attack planned by the British and Americans. There's a lot of drone activity taking mm -hmm. place, collecting intelligence about Russian weaknesses, uh, gaps in the Russian um, electronic surveillance, uh, physical protection, et cetera. And I believe that that British drone shot the gap and got right in there and blew up right where they wanted it to blow up. And it was directed by the British. There's some that say that this could only have been done if you had uh, assets close to the drone at the point of the attack, which means that British SBS commandos probably had to get uh, into place where they could uh, guide it in. This is something that the British did. The Ukrainians didn't do this. The mm -hmm. British did this together with the Americans. This is a massive escalation on uh, on the part of, uh, of, of of Ukraine and its allies. Um, what the Russian response will be, we don't know, but the Ukrainians and their allies are hoping that it'll be an overreaction, one that um, then can be spun into being linked to the potential for a global food crisis um, massive starvation and um, Russia's the bad guy and the world turns on Russia. That's what they're hoping to do. So that's my assessment. In the <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, now I have goosebumps after your assessment. <laughs> that's uh, um, So if you say that um, that the British uh, did directly do this, um, do you think uh, it will have any kind of, uh, you know, ramifications in direction of uh, to the British or will the response only be in the direction of of the Ukrainians to the Ukrainians? Well, the British have admitted that they've deployed a special air service squadron um, into, um, I mean, they haven't formed, but it's it's sort of acknowledged that there's a, a special air service squadron operating on the soil of Ukraine at 60 yeah. to 100 uh, British special operators. I believe the special air service squadron has been supplemented by a special boat service yes. uh, capability. <laughs> And it's the special boat service that did this. Um, and the special boat service is probably operating out of uh, the vicinity of Odessa, meaning they're on the ground in Ukraine. I think the Russians are going to try and kill as many of these people as possible. I think it's uh, okay. that basically, it's a, it, but they're going to kill them on Ukrainian soil. Okay. I don't think the Russians are going to expand this conflict by reaching out and touching British assets. Um, yeah. And it could expand this conflict. But if I... If I were a Brit, I would be very worried right now because I think uh, the Russians are are gunning for you and any Ukrainians. And if I were the Americans, I'd be dumping all the British phone numbers from my phone right now. <laughs> I'd be staying as far away from the Brits as I could because um, I, I just think the Russians are going to be in the business of killing the people responsible for this attack. Yeah. I wouldn't want to be the uh, the SBU headquarters. Um, again, I can't predict what what's what's going to happen. Uh, but yeah. the SBU is apparently taking credit for this. Um, mm -hmm. So I wouldn't want to be the SBU headquarters and I wouldn't want to be any employee of the SBU. And um, well, we'll see. Again, I can't predict what the Russians are doing. What I can say is that Vladimir Putin and the Russian uh, command and 
mainly Vladimir Putin, has been very good about escalation management, meaning that they have their eyes on the target and their target is the strategic defeat of Ukraine. And the best way to achieve that is the physical destruction of the Ukrainian army. And the best way to ensure that happens is to ensure that the only problem set they face on the battlefield is the Ukrainian army. They don't want to do anything where the where there's an excuse for NATO forces either as part of NATO or as a coalition of the willing to come in and complicate this battlefield. So I think you're going to see the Russians continue escalation management, continue not to take the bait and continue to push forward. But politically, um, this this is a problem for Russia because escalation management sometimes is construed, has been misconstrued in the West as a sign of weakness, when actually it's a sign of strength. And increasingly in Russia, especially after the Prigozhin revolt, there's a political problem now that Putin you know, cannot be seen as um, too complacent in the face of repeated provocation. So I, I personally believe that there will be a, um, a, a stiff Russian response. I don't know what it's going to be, but I think it will be limited to Ukraine because they don't want to expand this conflict into something beyond what it already is. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, uh, thank you for your take. Uh, Mike, w w what is your take on, on, on this story? Well, I can tell you that I agree with, Ho with Scott 110%. I mean, every bridge uh, which transporting uh, military equipment, supplies, it's a legitimate target. Unfortunately for the, those those civilians, uh, it, it, it happened. Um, I remember that during the, the bombing of Yugoslavia, NATO intentionally they, they bombed the strategic bridges on the Danube River and uh, all the way to, to the province of Kosovo. So yeah, those bridges are used for the military transport. The same thing is, for instance, if the military is using the school, this is a legitimate target. It becomes a legitimate target because uh, the military is stationed, uh, stationed there. Now the way how it was executed, there is a you you, you can see you can almost smell the British uh, influence in this, uh, because uh, why is why is this? Uh, as Scott mentioned, SBS those guys are incredibly competent in, in doing that stuff. So are they involved in this this operation? I would say yes. Now how they executed that? Um, there was a there was a ship coming from from Odessa, and uh, there are some stories uh, still um, uh, unverified, but uh, likely that um, the drone or drones were actually launched from, the, from that ship because there is a, uh, those drones, they don't have a thousand kilometers or 500 uh, kilometers range. They, uh, they work in five, six hours and the, their speed is not uh, hundred miles per, per hour. So basically they're, they're, they're launched from the neutral water, waters somewhere uh, along to that uh, green corridor, which Russia does, does not control. So if they launch the, those drones there, the asset, American asset in the air, RC-135 drones, they have, they have, they are very carefully following the, the schedule of Soviet patrol, or Soviet, uh, <laughs> of Russian patrol boats, uh, communications. So they, they find, uh, they, uh, they found the, the gap. So uh, what can happen? They simply guide uh, those uh, those drones. Either it was underwater or um, uh, above the water, those <laughs> modified uh, modified uh, uh, vessels. Uh, idea was to uh, to come beneath the bridge and damage the the columns because th that is the weak point of the bridge. If you damage the column, the bridge is going to collapse. But uh, obviously, from uh, from those uh, those pictures and the video clips. Uh, uh, that uh, drone exploded, and the blast basically broke the uh, uh, broke the the, uh, the surface of the road. So it, it was it, it, it go up then fall, then fell down, but it it, uh, it not collapsed uh, completely. Uh, in the bridge uh, industry, they call it the deck. So the column was not damaged. Uh, the deck was damaged, so there, there's like like a twisting on one side. Of course, it, that that uh, that line is not not in use, uh, not in use for anymore. But this is not catastrophic damage, so that can be repaired. Russia can repair that within a month or two. The crucial point, the railway part, which bring uh, supplies, uh, uh, is not damaged. So, and Russia now they know uh, what is all about. So they will increase. They will. Uh, Quadruple the the patrols uh, around. So and they they will 
I'm expecting that tonight it will be some attacks on, the, on the some uh, critical Ukrainian targets, uh, maybe some headquarters, uh, and they, they're following with the, with the foreign mercenaries or foreign specialists. Scott, you mentioned uh, SBS, SAS. I think that also there's a Canadian uh, special uh, joint task force uh, too. I think they're already there. So foreign mercenaries, foreign uh, uh, special forces, they're there. Uh, Ukraine is not uh, capable to do this on, on, on its own. No disrespect to them for them, but they don't have the, the, those means. They don't have uh, the equipment. But uh, the, the how to say that the, the 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 biggest help that the NATO provide to Ukraine is not actually the weapon yeah. itself. It is information, and this information how how they follow the uh, the movements of Russian uh, Russian units and especially Russian com commands, high ranking commands for brigade, uh, regiment, brigade, and division. So uh, they're trying to, to localize the, localize them so that uh, they can transfer information on time to the artillery unit so they can launch either uh, HIMARS uh, or they can at attack with, uh, with the Storm Shadows. So NATO, uh, uh, the main uh, need to help the Ukraine is, uh, is in, in information, sharing information with the joint, uh, with the joint centers. It's not like a, only NATO center in, uh, in Ukraine. There, there are a couple of them. Some of them are on the west. Some of them are located in Odessa. And I think that uh, tonight or in, in the days to come, some of those centers will be hit. And I, la I simply like that if, if somebody has the British numbers in, in the phone, <laughs> better delete them because uh, there, there, is a mean, there are means to, uh, to, to find it. Now, the, that famous grain deal, uh, from some statistics, 97% of grain is not going to the, to the poorest countries in the world, only 3%. So 97% is coming to, Ukraine, to, to, the, uh, to the EU. So what the what EU is doing with that? They can repack, they can uh, resell, they can even send back to Ukraine as a humanitarian aid. But also there, there is um, what's going on with the, with, the, with the money with that. So there is a very, very murky, uh, murky world uh, in uh, putting money from one, uh, one, pot, uh, one pot to another. So Russia, in my opinion, Russia is going first to, to stick to that Green Deal. It is not going to create a world crisis on the level that uh, the that West expect, because uh, Russia can supply that 3% of the poor countries with their own grain. Uh, but on the, on the long term, yeah, on the long term, it, it may be shortages. Uh, and that, that is likely to happen. Um, now, the, the second thing is Russia is going to wait. They're not going to indiscriminately now attack every single target in, in Ukraine, like destroy Ukrainian bridges or uh, attack uh, infrastructure, uh, or attack maybe 750 kilowatt uh, uh, transformer stations. So Russia is going to uh, to very, very carefully assess the situation and target uh, those who are responsible. So SBU will be targeted likely, maybe even some, some uh, members of Ukrainian parliament that uh, providing a lot, a lot of talks, you know, the, there is a lot, a lot of some, some nonsenses that, that they're talking, uh, that, which, which are also calling for the execution of some, uh, Russian public uh, figures and, and, and officials. So yeah, uh, and uh, the Putin is master of, uh, of dealing with that stuff. Uh, he's, he's not increasing escalation. He's not decreasing it. So he's keeping pressure. And this is, this is the war of attrition. This, this attrition war is not, uh, does not work for, for Ukraine because Ukraine, uh, they can, they can uh, resist for some time. There is no doubt about the bravery of, the, of, of their soldiers or their troops. But uh, they're, they're facing one slot of uh, army, which is 10, 10 times uh, or tenfold uh, better equipped, uh, uh, better, uh, uh, better trained. They have um, uh, almost unlimited uh, quantities of ammunition. All of that stories about uh, that uh, Russia is uh, going to going out of uh, rockets or missiles. It's just a kindergarten stories for the for those uh, unserious uh, forums or, or whatever people uh, yeah. talk about that. So this is this is the war of attrition. In war of attrition, you grind your enemy. You grind your enemy slowly but steady. You increase the pressure, but you not uh, exponentially increase that pressure. Uh, you you uh, you want your enemy to stand so that you can grind him. Yeah. You don't want him to run to take the territory. So you want to uh, to get uh, uh, to de to destroy his equipment, his uh, uh, manpower, and his uh, his morale. And Russia is doing that. And Russia has the time. See. In the, uh, in the West, we have watches, very expensive watches, but on the East, they have time. <laughs>
yeah, yeah, I, I know this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I thank you for for your take. Um, I'd like to come back to the grain deal. You already mentioned it. Mm -hmm. um, this this question goes to um, Scott. Um, we heard about the, the let's say political and economical um, implications of the end of this deal. Um, but what are the military implications in the Black Sea um, with the end of this deal? What what are your thoughts on this? Well, I mean, first of all, you can't you can't separate the the political from the military because war is an extension of politics by other means. So, um, right. You know, <laughs> so we, we 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 have to, for instance, we have to look at the uh, impact this has on Turkey. Turkey has made a bundle of money off of this because mm -hmm. most of this grain goes to Turkey, and Turkey then processes it into the flour um, that then is packaged and and used to deliver you know raw grain doesn't just show up in europe it's and turkey has entire industries who are who are doing this and they make a lot of money so turkey's got a an economic problem right now that they that they don't need um this this uh, the impact on the world food program is as mike said um it's not as though the the, the food you know 97 of this goes to uh, europe but the problem isn't the the, the lack of food The way the World Food Program works is that they don't have a bunch of food out there. They they get allocated money. And so, for instance, when the United States supports the World Food Program, we, we give a tranche of money. And then that money is used to buy a product. Um, the product is there. The problem is, look what happened as soon as the grain deal went down. Commodity prices shot up 3%, and they're probably going to go up more. So when the prices go up, The money that's been given, because the, the 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 donors have already received their money. They have their allocation. Yep. Let's say they get a hundred bucks. And so they've planned a hundred dollar budget to go and do things, but suddenly the price of food has gone up. They, they don't have the money for their budget anymore. So the budget collapses. And so that's that's what really that's the time crunch right now. It's not the that the food isn't there. As Mike said, the food is there. Russia can provide the food. The problem is that the structures that are designed to deliver the food um, don't have the money to do that. They haven't been given the money and nobody's going to give them the money in the short term. So this is this is the nature of the problem, which and that's and the reason why I define it that way is that's the political reality right now. So now right. what's going to happen in order for Russia to get grain to the places that need it? Russian ships have to be able to go through the, 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 the Bosphorus and the Dardanelles. Um, And so when people say, what's going to happen in the Black Sea? Uh, you know, as, as Mike said, there's the Green Corridor. And Russia doesn't control the Green Corridor. Is Russia going to shut down the Green Corridor? Uh, the moment Russia does that, uh, you're going to get a political reaction from Turkey. And Turkey may not allow Russian ships to go through uh, the Bosphorus and the Dardanelles, at least in the way that they, they need to. And so Russia has to control its military response based upon political realities that you can't do things that might make sense militarily now come on mike and i i we both know what needs to happen odessa <laughs> needs to be shut down yeah. odessa needs to, <laughs> needs to exist odessa needs to be wiped off the face of the earth we know that needs to happen from a military standpoint but politically it can't happen Yeah, it can't happen politically sure. for any number of reasons, and one of which is with is this 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 food crisis that we have that has to be managed. There's a political need to manage this because Russia needs to ensure that when the whole world, for instance, when China picks up the phone, Xi Jinping calls up and says, "Hey, Vlad, buddy, pal, Bubba, <laughs> um, we got a food crisis." And I'm getting a call from Modi. Modi's unhappy right now because there's a food crisis. And uh, he's getting a call from Lula down in Brazil. And the BRICS is like, what the hell is going on with this food crisis? What are you going to do about that, Vlad? And Vlad's got to be able to go, we got this one under control, pal. Z, I'm sending ships right now full of grain. They're going to make it to Africa. Nobody's going to starve to death. And Z's going to go, good job, Vlad. No more political pressure. Because that's how, that's how it works. 
But if yeah. Vladimir Putin sinks every ship and blows up Odessa and everything else, Z's going to call and go, Vlad, what the hell is going on, buddy? <laughs> buddy, it's got out of control. This is insane. <laughs> because this isn't just about sinking ships in the Black Sea, pal. We're all for that. We want to sink ships in the Taiwan Strait, too. But we don't <laughs> because we're smarter than that. We understand there's ramifications. Stop sinking ships. Putin doesn't want that phone call. And so I believe that the Russian response is going to be a very measured response that relates to the political realities, the geopolitical realities of the, Absolutely. Of the food crisis. And so I don't think you're going to see ships sinking, because if that was the solution, the ships would have been sunk already. Yeah. I believe that Russia is going to find a way to get this grain deal back up and running. Why? Because Russia needs Turkey. Russia needs Turkey on its side, and Turkey makes too much money off of this. Uh, plus, the entire food system is geared around Turkish, um, again, I'm losing the word, but when you grind the grain into flour, it's called something. <laughs> you press, <laughs> there's a process there, a milling, yeah. I guess. Milling, is that it? Milling? Yeah, um, I think, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Translated yeah. from Serbian, it would make sense. Yeah, milling. Milling. <laughs> milling. Milling. I know about killing. I don't know so much about <laughs> milling, but milling, I think you mill the the grain into flour and and all that. Turkey has Turkey has sort of a corner on that market, especially for the stuff coming out of Ukraine and Russia. It goes to Turkey, and Turkey does that. And the whole world food program, therefore, is geared on a Turkish supply. So I think Russia is going to get back. And, and if you take a look at their response, they say we can start this thing up immediately. Immediately. Russia says we can we can begin this immediately. They wouldn't have put that clause in there if they were going to blow the hell out of Odessa. Excuse my language. They were going to yeah. take Odessa out of the problem. So I think you're going to see a very measured response from Russia mm -hmm. uh, in the Black Sea. I think, as Mike indicated, um, the, the response is going to be very targeted and it's going to be targeted on the ground. It's going to be targeted against physical structures on the ground, geared towards Ukrainian leadership, British presence on the ground. I think Odessa will be hit, but not in a way that it should be hit. Because frankly speaking, Odessa should not be allowed to ship another shipment out because they are using this. There's good reason to believe that Odessa was the source of the explosive that blew up the Crimea Bridge the first time. Absolutely. That they, that Absolutely. they used they used a ship coming out uh, to that. There's a good reason to believe that the British and the CIA and others have adapted many of these ships to smuggle weaponry in and out. Um, and it appears that the British used one of these ships as a mothership to get them close to Crimea along the Green Corridor from which they attacked, they launched their, their attack. Um, so the military response is to shut it down. <laughs> and they can do the russians could shut it down that quick but Absolutely. the political response is you got to keep the food program viable this cannot be allowed to be spun into a global crisis that puts russia on the wrong side of the telephone call that we talked about so i think we're going to see a very measured response in the black sea yeah yeah thank you uh when i when i listen to your explanation uh it comes to me that like um russia could strike a deal with Turkey without the European Union um, mm -hmm. for the, for the for the for the grain because the European Union uh, should connect Russia to SWIFT and they don't do it <laughs> and uh, yeah maybe Russia will do it with uh, solely with uh, with Turkey I don't know we will see um, yeah, it's open open business uh, excuse me yeah, it's open business. I mean, uh, President yeah. Erdogan. President Erdogan is, is a tradesman. You know, it, yeah. maybe if you go to in Istanbul, if you go to do Kapali Charshi and you know, all of those small boutiques, you can always make a deal, and you will you will find people ready to make a deal. He will give you this or ask for that. So yeah, it's 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 in the nature to make a deal, and somebody's going to make a bakshish, but uh, it's important to make a deal. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, thank you for that. Um, let's go to the next point. Um, <clears throat> Several commanders of the Russian army uh, have been app uh, apparently dismissed or transferred to other units. Um, Scott and Mike, uh, is it Maskirovka to transfer ba uh, battle-hardened commanders to Belarus? Is it a purge or is it a developing uh, frustration with the SMO approach? The question is for both of you. Mike, go. 
<laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, it is not unusual that in the um, uh, in the war uh, uh, people go, uh, get uh, moved from the one position to another. So uh, it's always uh, you know always the story. Yeah, they don't they don't perform. They're not uh, uh, they're now against uh, the president or there is always uh, rumors. But uh, experienced military commander. Uh, he can always uh, put uh, put uh, his uh, his experience to the new position. On his position will come somebody else. So it, it is almost like a natural uh, uh, circle of uh, ro it is rotation. So rot uh, rotate commanders, uh, so that all all of them can have a can have experience. I, I would not rule out that there is uh, something in in the background. You know, some of them maybe simply like to have a. This, this this special military operation uh, engage 100% troops and just solve the problem, wipe out uh, Ukraine from up to Dnieper or whatever. But uh, you know, it's it's not just just a military military operation; it's political stuff. And also after this, uh, Prigozhin uh, revolt to to call that. Uh, of course, he had uh, some some sympathizer for, in, uh, with, uh, in in the Russian military ranks, but. Uh, Russian military, it's a, it's a system. It's not somebody, some, some individuals which are sticking out and can talk whatever they want. If you, see, if you see Russian generals, they are not going to the public media. They are not talking about their Facebook pages or uh, Twitter accounts or something like that. In Ukraine, you have something different. You have every uh, Ukrainian uh, high-ranking commander has a Facebook page uh, or uh, Twitter or whatever. So they're, they're, they're talking there. Now, the question is, uh, general in the war, He's a busy person. He's he's running his troops. He's running operation. He's running strategy and tactics. He he does simply doesn't have time to spend uh, on the social media, because if high ranking officers spend time on high on the social media, well, who is running his uh, his troops? Chief of the staff, or maybe somebody who is who is not really born. In, in, in that country and, uh, and came maybe as, as an advisor or maybe not just one, maybe five, six, ten of them. So that's the reason why uh, there is a, like a joint commands, joint command centers, which may be targeted uh, by Russians as, as of tonight or in the, in the days to come. So we, we'll see, I mean, time, time will tell. I don't think that there is a purge in Russian, uh, uh, Russian uh, ranks because uh, this is the... Uh, they're going to rotate people. They're going to bring people uh, to get experience. And uh, the most important, uh, that special military operation is going according to their plans. So to, to keep to keep make that mechanism uh, going. You know, if you look at it as, as a motor, as an engine. Um, Mike, I think the you troops. Can, can yeah, you repeat uh, the, the last 15 seconds? Um, yeah, the, the rotation the... rotation among the troops, it's something normal. So I don't think that there is a purge in the, in the Russian uh, Russian ranks. And uh, it's something that uh, that is related to the to the, uh, some uh, deep looking strategy. So the more and more Russians will uh, high, high, high ranking Russian commanders will have experience. Yeah, I understand. Thank you for that. Scott, what do you think? No, I agree. I, I, I'll take it even uh, a step further. Um, and, and Mike, you, 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 you and I, I think, have similar uh, backgrounds, uh, company grade officer backgrounds. Um, yeah. You know, so yeah. we're familiar with the following. The sergeant that knows everything. <laughs> Absolutely. So you got the sergeant on the ground and, and he can be the best sergeant in the world. Probably is the best sergeant in the world. Great troop leader. Uh, he's got he, he tactically proficient. He can lead his guys and um, man, and, and he's performing well. He's doing the job, but he's frustrated because he asked for 100 grenades and he got 80. He's like, I got to win this. I'm the one fighting. Give me 100 grenades. I know better than you. And he's sitting there, Lieutenant, Lieutenant, you're sitting in your tent drinking your coffee. You know, why aren't you getting me my hundred grenades? What he doesn't know is the Lieutenant actually sent the request up to the captain and the captain sat down and said, yeah, but we're planning a, an offensive in the spring and we're trying to hoard grenades for that offensive. So we've reduced the allocation. You see, there's a, a bigger thing going on here than you or the, the captain's on your side, but he sends it up to the colonel who spoke to the general that said, yeah, but there was a strike in Huntsville, Alabama at the hand grenade factory, and they ain't making hand grenades as much as they were, or a train blew up or something. What I'm saying is there's a big picture out there that the sergeant don't know about. 
And the sergeant should just shut up and keep doing the sergeant's job. And so now we take it to the Russians. Okay, right now the SMO, Special Military Operations, is a big deal. Um, and there's a lot of people, and the, and the Russian general leadership actually gets pushed down. Leadership gets pushed down. So their generals are operating in a more intimate fashion with the troops than their Western counterparts would be. So they're down there with the sergeants, with the captains, with the lieutenant colonels. They're experiencing all this stuff, and it becomes emotional for them. Uh, it becomes an emotional commitment to them to want to do the right thing by these guys. And the sergeant and guys, they're, they're, they're like, hey, boss, we've been here for a long time. Sort of promised one of those big vacations. We ain't getting the vacation. Uh, troops are getting a little unhappy out here. And the general, instead of saying, you know, now you're not going to get it right now because we just we strategically we can't do it. Uh, the general's like, I'm with them. We're not getting the vacation. What the general doesn't understand is that there's something more than the SMO going on right now. Mm -hmm. Russia has expanded its military from 900,000 to 1.5 million. And that expansion is taking place as we speak. And this mm -hmm. is an expansion that relates directly to NATO expansion. There's a new military district being formed in Leningrad, five divisions strong, 70,000 troops. It needs to be formed right now. There's an mm -hmm. urgency right now. Now, there's a strategic necessity right now. And when you build something from scratch, it's not just getting the manpower, but you have to divert the resources necessary. What contingency is being offered or being given to this uh, new Leningrad military district? One, to defend, not Leningrad, I'm sorry, St. Petersburg. No. See <laughs> 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 uh, now, old fool. But you know, so St. Petersburg, it has to pr protect against any projection of power that may come out of Finland or out of the Baltics. So they've got to build up. That means you have to defend. Defense is a very resource intensive thing, as we know. Mm -hmm. The Russians use a lot of artillery in defense. So guess why you're not getting the, all the artillery ammunition you want right now, Mr. Commanding General in the SMO? Because Russia needs to protect St. Petersburg from NATO. And so they're diverting artillery ammunition to there to meet the contingency requirements that have been set mm -hmm. for this new St. Petersburg military district. Now, the sergeant in the foxhole isn't aware of that. Neither, apparently, is the general who's supporting the sergeant in the foxhole. So the general's spouting off stuff and creating a political problem. And that's what's happening here. There's a political problem. These generals are causing a problem. And they're accusing Shoigu and Gerasimov of malpractice, of corruption, of incompetence. Mm -hmm. But the fact of the matter is, Shoigu and Gerasimov are geniuses, literal geniuses, because they're mm -hmm. not only winning the war on the ground, General. <laughs> Think about it, General. <laughs> the reason why they're winning right now isn't because of you. It's not yeah. because of the general on the ground. It's because Shoigu and Gerasimov mobilized 300,000 men mobilized 150 to 200,000 volunteers, trained them. You didn't train them, General. They trained yeah. them. Equipped them with a defense industry that you, General, had nothing to do with reinvigorating. That's Shoigu and Gerasimov doing that. That's them going around touring, putting the f pressure on the factories to produce mm -hmm. more, to meet the schedule that exceeds not just what you need in the special military operation, but what Russia needs to defend it in the mm, St. Petersburg yeah. Military District in the Arctic, in the Pacific, in the Pacific, in the Pacific, you know, where a lot of stuff's going on right now in the Pacific. And everybody's like, no one's talking about it, but Russia knows about it because that's Shoigu and Gerasimov's job to know all this, oh, yeah. to be prepared for everything. And they're doing a great job. Look at Lancet production. It was basically, yeah. you know, benchmark <laughs> production going in. Yeah. They're now, what, 200,000 going up to 1.5 to 2 million. They've expanded from the Lancet 3 to the Lancet 53. It's going to be swarm of drones coming in, mm -hmm. Star Wars stuff. General, you had nothing to do with that. Shoigu and Gerasim have had everything to do with that. You're winning because they built a defensive line. Now, Serovikin had something to do with that, too. But Serovikin learned to take orders and execute the orders. The generals that are being rotated out are generals that forgot that their job is to execute orders, not challenge the command, especially when they don't understand what the command's doing. Now, these generals aren't being fired. This isn't Stalin-esque. They're not going to be taken out, have their teeth knocked out, yeah. sent off to the gulag. Yeah. 
they're going to be reassigned to places like the command, the, 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 the uh, command academy. Well, they'll be given a job instructing and they'll teach people about what they learned on the battlefield, but they'll also start to learn, relearn, by the way, because they once knew this. That there's a bigger thing out there than just a special military operation. Yeah, yeah. That there's a huge thing called the Russian defense enterprise that's being stressed as we speak by an expanding NATO, a NATO that wants to move into the Pacific, uh, a, 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 a Japan that's starting to challenge Russia more aggressively on the Kuril Islands, on uh, Korea that could spin out of control. You know, if there's a war in the Korean Peninsula, Russia's involved. Uh, all mm -hmm. these things are out there, and these generals are going to get a chance to re-educate themselves, and eventually they could be re rotated back once they've been suitably re-educated. Uh, but this this isn't a purge in the classic sense. This isn't a Stalin. But this is a problem that's brought on by the Purgosian effect. Because yeah, Purgosian yeah. was the ultimate crybaby. Purgosian was the guy who thought he knew everything. Um, and the Wagner commanders, shame on them, because they know better. Uh, they, they, mm -hmm. you know, they allowed the mouthing off to take place without putting him in his place as they should have done early mm -hmm. on. They've paid a price um, in, in a loss of prestige, but uh, you know it looks like some of them may be given an opportunity to um, commit to a training mission in Belarus. But Wagner also had a global mission. You got to remember that, mm -hmm. that they had 30,000 mm -hmm. guys in Africa right. who uh, weren't rotating out for the last year. And those yeah. 30,000 guys are rotating out and 30,000 are going into Africa. And they're continuing that mission as part of the Russian enterprise. So there's still good relations there. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Russia is going to repair the relationship with whatever Wagner is going to be called. I don't know if it'll be called yeah. Wagner or something else. It doesn't matter. All we do know is that Prigozhin won't be a part of it because Prigozhin can never again be trusted. Um, and these generals that bought into the Wagner mystique and bought, it, bought into the sergeant syndrome of criticizing their seniors when they don't understand what's going on, they'll be rotated out. And those that can be rehabilitated will be brought back in. Russia's mm -hmm. not in the vindictive business, but uh, you know, I think that's what it is. They just don't understand the big picture. And there is a very big picture out there. And Shoigu and Gerasimov are doing a very good job. Maybe they have what all senior management has sometimes, a problem with empathizing with their, their subordinates. Uh, yeah. Oftentimes, leaders get caught up in the big picture and they don't pay enough attention to what's going on. Because a lot of this could have been resolved by through simple communication or, you know, dealing with the issue on the periphery. You don't have to give them everything they want, but you just have to make them think that you actually care about mm -hmm. them and are giving them something. You could solve a lot of these problems. I think there is a tendency amongst the senior Russian leadership chains to sort of get caught up in the rarefied air of running Russia, and they sometimes forget that there's a war going on and, and mm -hmm. stuff. And you see that. You saw Shoigu suddenly realize he has to make a physical presence on the in the theater. He has to go down there and be seen, and Gerasimov the same way. Um, but Fundamentally speaking, I think the Russian defense enterprise is very healthy. I think mm -hmm. they're very well positioned for victory on the battlefield. And I think what's going on with the Russian officers is a situational rotation uh, driven by an infection of sergeant syndrome amongst generals mm -hmm. that should have known better, and they will be re appropriately re-educated. As Mike said, you know, the, the Russians are professional. It's not like, you know, it's not like, you know, that old adage. <laughs> Uh, how important are you? Stick your hand in a bucket of water, pull your hand out. How big is the hole you left behind? Well, there isn't a hole. That's how important you are. So yeah. for the vet, for, for, for most military officers and professional military organizations, the organizations are designed for a dynamic leader to take one in the head and die because there's another dynamic leader behind that will come in and yeah, replace with it. Yeah. And yeah, and so that's what the Russians, they're going to remove these officers. They're going to replace them with dynamic officers who aren't going to be infected with Sergeant Syndrome. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, that, that, that was a great strategic picture. Thank you for that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Scott, I for, forgot to mention it at the, at the beginning. Uh, you had a uh, birthday two days ago. Happy birthday. All the best oh, to you. Happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very sorry. much. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, 40 years old. 40 years old. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> Why not 30? <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> some wise. <laughs> I could look like I could look like a very old forty-year-old, but I don't think I could. Do that. <laughs> 
okay. Um, I, I had later another question uh, re regarding Wagner, but you just mentioned it, so I will ask the next, uh, the next question to you as well, Scott. Um, we, we saw the, the last two days um, some columns, uh, big columns of Wagner troops um, driving in Voronezh and I don't know, uh, to B Belgorod, uh, yeah. in a co column with pickup trucks and so on. Um, it looks to me like a big sparking, uh, sparkling carrot. Um, what, what, what are your thoughts on this? And uh, Mike, if you like, you can add uh, also something. Yeah. So yeah, what do you first. think? Mm -hmm. um, if you've got 25,000 guys sitting in camps in Lugansk that um, are unemployed, and you have a uh, an understanding with the Russian government that um, these guys can, uh, some of them, if they want to, can um, go to Belarus and seek employment there. Um, they have to get there somehow. So they're going to drive there and pick up trucks. But when they drive in pickup trucks, guess what you didn't see? You didn't see heavy equipment trailers with tanks. You didn't see uh, BTRs or BMPs. You didn't see Pantsir air defense systems. You mm -hmm. didn't see artillery. Um, these, this is manpower only. So when you add up all those, the, 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 the vehicles in the convoy, I mean, how many guys are you honestly fitting into your Toyota, uh, you know, land cruiser? Yeah. Two, two per vehicle, maybe three. Yeah. Um, it's a long trip. You don't want to put too many in there cause they got to stretch and all that stuff. <laughs> you got to have a place to put your potato chips and your soda. So <laughs> these guys are, are moving there in the back and the, you know, they have tarps over their, 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 their. SUVs, trailers, trailers, yeah, so. trailers. Mm -hmm. So you got what some some personal equipment, some uh, so. But it that's not war fighting. That's not how an army moves. That's how people move. And so what you're seeing is the movement of manpower uh, to Belarus, where they'll fall in on uh, on on the base that's been prepared for them, and then they will do the mission that's been given to them, which right now is a it appears to be a training mission, so that. Um, you know, they, they will train. That means they're falling in on a on a system that already has the equipment, the, the mm -hmm. weapons, the facilities, etc. This isn't Wagner sending a 25,000 man uh, division uh, into Belarus to threaten Kiev or threaten Poland or anything. It's That's not happening. First of all, I don't think there's that many of them going there. I, I'd be surprised if the number was more than 500 to 1,000 based upon what I saw, just because you count up the vehicles. Um, yeah. You know, there's not yeah. that many people in the vehicles. Uh, so yes. um, I, I think, you know, what we don't know is uh, how many Wagner signed contract with the Ministry of Defense. We don't know that yet. Yeah. We do know that according to Putin's own uh, uh, discussion about the, the meeting that he had is that when he talked to Wagner about the need to integrate fully with Russia and all that, uh, that most of the commanders were shaking their head yes. But Putin says that Prigozhin, who couldn't see them, was saying, my guys will never accept this. But Prigozhin doesn't count anymore. He's finished. He's done. So the question is, those guys are not in their head. How many of them signed contracts with the Russians? And what what did those contracts constitute? Uh, Wagner had some very capable units. Um, because remember, Wagner started as a, literally a, a battalion-sized entity back in 2014. Uh, and it developed some specialized units, some reconnaissance units, uh, things of that nature that were used to train Lugansk and Donetsk militias and to fulfill specific combat needs. These are very experienced guys who have also gone to Syria and Africa and mastered their skill set. Um, and so if I were the Russian Ministry of Defense, I would want to take some of these units and incorporate them as a unit, keep this mm -hmm. capability together. Um, and, 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 and sign them over as a volunteer unit. In many ways, same thing that the Chechens are doing. You know, the Chechens yeah. built the Akhmat forces. They're not designed based upon Russian Ministry of Defense table of organization and all that stuff. The Chechen Republic says, this is what an Akhmat unit looks like. This is what it does. And they build it. Then they sign a contract with the Russian uh, Ministry of Defense. They're certified as a volunteer unit. And they go forth and subordinate themselves underneath uh, the, the, the Russian uh, command structure. And I think that... Um, that there might be some Wagner units that did that. But remember, a lot of these Wagner units, uh, these so-called shock units that were created um, after the big contract was signed, because remember, prior to May of 2022, Wagner was still a battalion-sized force. It wasn't yeah. a big force. Yeah. Uh, and that's where the majority of their, of their military expertise is. As they expanded, they're bringing in people who 
aren't as experienced and they expanded the specific shock units that incorporated convict um, personnel. Yep. The convict personnel, uh, depending on whose numbers, could have been 10,000 of them, could have been 30,000 of them. We don't know um, yep. because we don't know the numbers, but they received 21 days of training. Now, Mike, how many elite forces are trained in 21 days? None. <laughs> um, how many, how many, how many competent military forces are trained in 21 days? None. Yeah. So 21 days of training allows you to hold a weapon, aim a weapon, shoot a weapon roughly, and move forward with some minimal tactical um, expertise. But the bottom line is you're going to be killed in large numbers, which is what their job was. Their job was to go in and absorb casualties, take terrain, and then the the reconnaissance companies, the strike companies, the good guys came in behind them, took over the position, laid down base of fire, and then they moved on again. So these shock units don't exist anymore. So the majority of Wagner's structure doesn't exist anymore because you're not getting the, the manpower that's there. Um, and so I, I think what you're going to see is, um, you know, maybe at the end of the day, several thousand Wagner guys may show up in Belarus as training. Um, I would be shocked if the Belarus government allowed them to um, consolidate into a combat unit because fool me once, shame on me, <laughs> fool me twice, you know, won't get fooled again. Um, but we'll see. I don't. I can't predict the future. I don't know what the future holds. Uh, I do know that Wagner still has its uh, African mission um, and its Syrian mission, and those missions haven't gone away. Uh, and they're doing a rotation right now to to rotate the troops out and the guys coming back from Africa. If you, the Wagner contract has not been dissolved. Uh, meaning mm -hmm. that if, it, and it was interesting. And when the FSB raided Prigozhin's uh, mansion, they took a photograph of the initiating document for Wagner. It's a fascinating document uh, about what it talks about. But one of the guarantees in there is a guarantee of employment, yeah. which, um, you know, is, is still part of the contractual. So these guys coming back from Africa have to be given employment opportunities by Wagner. And um, right now they have three opportunities. Go back to Africa. Oh, or Syria, um, go to Belarus to be a trainer, or go sign a contract with the Ministry of Defense. Those are the three. Uh, those are the three employment opportunities for the the Wagner guys. There's no longer go join the uh, the big SMO unit. That unit doesn't exist anymore and will never mm -hmm. exist again. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Uh, uh, because uh, Wagner, it's a, it's a professional unit, and um, I will also want to add. Uh, uh, majority of command uh, cadre in, in, in Wagner, they are former military uh, officers, uh, all the way uh, from the rank of sergeant to the to the colonel, so yeah, maybe uh, major generals. So those uh, those those key people, their experience now they have experience in in, in combat, and they're very valuable um, instructor uh, instructor base, and Belarus uh, military will definitely benefit benefit from that. Uh, and I absolutely agree with, with the number of them in Belarus. When you, when you count how many guys you can put in the car for the long trip, yeah, two, three guys, top, because you need to put your stuff in, in, in the back, in the trunk, or, or uh, in the trailer. So a lot of them uh, likely signed uh, with the Ministry of, Defe uh, Ministry of Defense, Russian Ministry of Defense. So they will be uh, simply uh, be assigned to some, some other units under the command of the uh, Russian, uh, uh, Russian command structure you know, or, or work like, like Ahmad. Ahmad uh, Special Forces, so it's uh, like an autonomous, uh, independent unit, but within the within the chain of command. So they are not just going around and doing whatever they want. The, uh, that is the point. And both Chechens and Wagner, Wagnerites, they're very experienced. They, uh, they, they have uh, many many years, uh, especially their uh, command uh, command staff. And also those uh, the people in in, in, the, in in the Wagner management, let's say from the Colonel Woodkin. Nobody knows how it's, there is just few pictures circulating <laughs> circulating web. Those guys are very very close to the to the Russian political uh, uh, political uh, leaders. So there will be definitely a job for them, and they will go to Africa because there is Russian interest there. They're going to going to do. They they will tra train Belarus and Bel Belarus military. Uh, they will get all equipment that they want there. There's hundreds of BTRs, tanks, uh, uh, BM-21s, uh, whatever. Whatever they want, they will get. Uh, and, the, and, the, and the third thing, 
is, is a part of the um, of the new contract signed with the DND in the form of uh, Ahmed, uh, Ahmed Group or so, so very, very similar stuff. They will continue operations. But Prigozhin is, I agree uh, with score definitely, Prigozhin, he made mistake. He is too impulsive. He, he really didn't think. And uh, obviously, he's not military professional. He is somebody who, who doesn't have that, that core, that core value. He's a military professional. He's more like a, like a stunt, like like a, like like um, some of those Hollywood stars that uh, that doing from time to time uh, very ex uh, <laughs> extreme uh, appearances and, uh, and and talks. So the, he he's gone. But idea of, of Wagner as, as a unit with the, with the Wagner name or some other name, it is going to uh, it is going to continue uh, their service because there there are Russian interests in the world where those guys can be very useful. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes, of course. Um, I'm wondering how the uh, African African um, leadership will um, re-establish the, the connections to Wagner because of the reputation loss. But we will see how how that uh, develop. So um, <clears throat> the next question, um, yeah, for Mike, um, can you give us an update about um, the recently delivered Western weapons for Ukraine. Um, I think the cluster ammunition. Um, I hear uh, Scott's thoughts already about this in another video, so maybe you can um, uh, tell you, uh, tell us your thoughts on this. Well, cluster ammunition is something that is uh, in use in Ukraine since 2014. So the Russia, they have their uh, Soviet Soviet Union actually. They they produce a whole set of different cluster, different types of cluster ammunition, from the aerial uh, bombs to the multiple uh, launcher rocket systems to the artillery shells. So uh, it is it is simply not a big deal. The biggest problem with cluster ammunition, in my opinion, is that uh, is reliability, because uh, it will be a lot of the dud uh, charges in, and for instance, up to 40, 40 to fifty percent maybe uh, will never explode. Uh, those, uh, especially the that cluster ammunition um, in the West, it is artillery shells, one hundred fifty five millimeters. So they're not going to deliver uh, bombs because you you need to have a Carrier for the for those bombs and uh, Ukraine uh, does not have uh, that kind of uh, air force that they can they can utilize the, that kind of ammunition. But artillery is there, 155 millimeters. Uh, they have systems, sir. so those uh, uh, those shells they're going to scrap uh, the bottoms of the warehouses and they will ship the old the old stuff. Why? Simply because uh, they're going to issue a contract to the manufacturers, and the, uh, the manufacturers are going to, to do the new stuff for the use with, uh, within NATO. So it can, it can see it in the stock. So it is good opportunity to, uh, to clean the st uh, storage facilities, uh, to, to ship everything to Ukraine, because it, it costs far less uh, shipment than to send for the special uh, factory, special, uh, special uh, facilities to, uh, to do the, the proper decommissioning. And in Ukraine, uh, in the West, basically nobody cares what is going to happen because the Ukrainians, they're going to, to fire those indiscriminately. They said that they're not going to fire that in uh, on the, on the civilian uh, or residential areas, but this is uh, uh, those are just words. They're going to, uh, to fire them anywhere where they think it's, uh, uh, there is a need for that. So in Russia, they, Russia is, is going to wait. We'll see how, how that stuff will work. Then Russia is going to, uh, to use their stuff but in much much larger scale, so the the, the biggest problem will be that I'm exploding stuff that they're going to litter the whenever they, they were fired, and it will be danger for the for the years to come. I'm I'm afraid that uh, that eastern portion of Ukraine is going to look almost like a Laos with all of those uh, unexploded stuff, which is uh, which was scat scattered by. Uh, but by, uh, by by U.S. military, so it uh, it is not game changer or how they they want to present game changer uh, version forty three, so yeah, nothing is going to change. It will be uh, more casualties on both sides and uh, especially danger for civilians. But it's not going to change anything on, on the battlefield. Ukraine is uh, Russia is going to continue their stuff. Russia is going to use whatever they they can, um, and they think it's it's appropriate. And it's simply uh, no wonder weapon, hundred percent, hundred fifty percent, because uh, it is it is something that is in, in use since since the first bullets were fired in, in in Ukraine. So no no not simply a big deal. Good for a business. 
in the companies in the West that they're making uh, that kind of ammunition because uh, once when the stocks are depleted, shipped to the um, uh, to the battlefield in Ukraine, they're going to uh, to make a big big money uh, producing new stuff. Uh, otherwise, no changes in the battlefield with that, so not not really big deal. Okay. Okay, I see. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I'm wondering um, whether the Russians are going to use um, these cluster ammunition as well because they consider the land as Russian territory, the soil. Um, I'm wondering whether they will use it on this soil. Uh, Scott, what do you think? I mean, that's 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 a fair. First of all, <clears throat> is there a military necessity for Russia to use cluster munitions? I believe the answer is no. Mm -hmm. um, okay. I think there might be a political um, component, and again, war is an extension of politics by other means, um, right. uh, to be seen as replying in kind. Um, but the last thing I think Russia would do is to use these weapons uh, indiscriminately um, in a way that led to the kind of um, a pollution of the um, of the terrain, so to speak, that would have to be cleaned up. Remember, this is Russia they're fighting on right now, um, Russian, Russian soil. Um, you know, Donetsk is Russia, Lugansk is Russia, Zaporizhia is Russia, Kherson is right now. The Ukrainians can disagree, but from the Russian perspective, it's Russian soil. So why would you do that? So I don't think it will be indiscriminate use. The cluster munitions are very effective in breaking up uh, massed armor um, assault. Uh, they, they, that's what they're designed to do, uh, infantry in the open, et cetera. Um, so you may get a demonstration use if the Ukrainians uh, sought to uh, yeah. sought to mass mass some armor and, and and make a move. You may get a demonstration use by the Russians to, uh, to to saturate that zone with cluster munitions to to take out. Because uh, Mike, remember there was a battle fought in um, in 2014 or 15 uh, between the Ukrainians. Uh, mm -hmm. They they brought in two. Uh, Two mechanized battalions, or yes. two or three, and yeah. uh, two battalions, yeah, two mechanized, yeah, two battalions. Uh, yeah. And they and they made a move against the Russians, and they got hit by Russian artillery, including cluster munitions. Yeah, and two battalions ceased to exist. Yeah. And um, NATO woke up on that one. I remember reading the articles where of uh, West Point's all like, "Oh my God, they lost two brigade, two battalions. These are two battalions that were trained to sort of NATO. Thing. They're gone. How'd that happen? Uh, Russian artillery. Um, so, you know." I think that you could get a situation again where if the situation warranted, uh, there could be a demonstration use of cluster mm -hmm. munitions. But Russia doesn't need to use these munitions. First of all, when you're dealing with trench warfare, uh, which is basically what's going on right now, um, you know, when the Russians attack an enemy trench line, imagine saturate. OK, let's say I, 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 I throw in DPICM. Now, um, the dud rate's going to be quite high quite high naturally, no matter what. But even yeah. under the terrain, you have to consider that this is undulating terrain, earth softened by rain, um, overhead cover. Uh, most of these trench lines are put into what they call the forest belts. And so you're going to have the forest belts, but even around them, the fields are as the mm -hmm. soft earth with growing grass. So it's going to absorb a lot of these bomblets that aren't going to explode. They may get embedded in the soil. They may get embedded in the side of the trench. They may bounce off a tree and go into the trench line, all this kind of stuff. And now the Russians are sending in their infantry to capture the trench line. And as the Russian infantry comes in, they're going to be losing legs and they're going to be dying. They're going to get their groins blown out, get their faces blown off from all these things. So it's Russia killing Russians with Russian weapons. No military planners yeah. want to do that. You want to use these in a crossroads where the enemy is massed armor and you want to take out the armor, but now you've, you you designate that area as a uh, unexploded ordnance risk area so that the first units you have coming through there are the minesweepers coming in and, and trying to detonate yeah, the yeah. for, for, and sweep them out of the way. But the trenches, what you want to do with the trenches is hit them with conventional high explosive. You want to collapse structures in on themselves. A bomblet doesn't collapse a structure. I hate to tell people right. about it. Yeah, right. yeah, pop, sure. pop, pop, yeah. pop. That's it. You need something that goes boom. Uh, you need yeah. something that would hits a trench, brings the trench in on the people. Yeah. That's conventional high explosive. And so that's what the Russians are going to use. They're not going to weaken their own uh, assault by using a weapon for purely political reasons. I think there will be 
a demonstration made, uh, but you know they they have to look out for what's in their best interests, uh, which is to preserve Russian life. That's what this is all about. If the Russians were in the business of throwing lives away, this war might have been over by now. Yeah. But Russia's not yeah. in the business of throwing lives away. Russia's mm-hmm. in the business of preserving as much life as possible uh, while taking as much of the enemy's life. So the the, the, the cluster munitions, I, I think, is um, it's a political thing. Uh, the Ukrainians, I, I think, will regret ever getting them uh, because yeah. they're not doing what they want. Uh, you know, it's anecdotal information, but uh, I follow uh, Colonel Kodakovsky, the, um, the Vostok Battalion commander, right. uh, on Telegram, and he talks about receiving. They've been shelled by cluster munitions right now. And it's exactly what I said. You know, they, 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 they're coming in, so the guys just get in the trench. It's a bad day if a, if a bomblet lands on top of you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Bad, day, okay? it, 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 bad luck. Okay, boom, you're dead or wounded or whatever. And unfortunately, that happens. But you're not losing the entire unit. It's not like they got hit with cluster munitions and suddenly you have 40% casualties and all that. Most of the guys are sitting in their trench, smoking their, 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 their paparossi and uh, pop, 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 snack, crackle, pop. Things go off. Things are hanging in the trees, bouncing the trench. You see it. You, you know, you have to bring in your engineers. You're going to remove it and all that stuff. It's an inconvenience to life, but having no impact on the Russians at all. And that's the reality. Whereas what the Ukrainians really needed was high explosive rounds. Yeah. Uh, they need high explosive to hit the mm-hmm. trenches, collapse the, the shelters, collapse the trench lines, stun, stun the Russian defenders. Because mm-hmm. that's what a lot of artillery does is it stuns you, mm-hmm. uh, blows out your eardrums, mm-hmm. gets your yeah. eyes working, gets your head not doing what it's supposed to do. So yeah. as you start to advantage and I got to pop up my AT4, I'm not thinking right. My head's raggled. I'm not aiming. Mm-hmm. I miss fire. And next thing you know, infantry's closed in on me and I'm getting riddled with bullets and dying. That's what artillery is supposed to do. Bomblets yeah. don't do that. Yeah. Also, what I would like to add, um, I'm going to mention that Russia is going to, uh, to respond tenfold. Uh, imagine this. You have a battalion of uh, Challenger tanks, which are not uh, involved in the, uh, in the fight yet. So that battalion with, let's say, um, three, two battalions of Bradleys um, got to in the concentration area. So they're getting ready to punch the Russian lines. Before that, um, the Ukrainians using shells to bomb, uh, cluster ammunition to bomb Russian uh, uh, trenches or try to, to hit somebody in um, some tanks or artillery positions uh, in the rear. Once when the, those Challenger tanks start to move, or when I mean, the Russia d- discovered that uh, concentration area, then that that is when uh, where the fun will uh, will start because they are going to shoot that with artillery shells, 152, with MLRS rockets, with cluster, and then it will it will come with um, uh, also with the Air Force. They will drop ten times more quantities of, of cluster, and they will saturate the area. Simply, if you have, let's say, 50% of that uh, charges, with that amount, thousands of uh, those bomblets, they're going to, uh, it, it, will be, it will be like like a rain, bomblet rain. And what is going to uh, to left of the of those challengers? Smoldering wrecks. So the Ukrainians, they don't that, they know that. And that's the reason why they don't even want to move challengers close to the, to the front line. Because leopards already suffer enough. And there is no 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 bigger happiness for the uh, competition design bureaus to see how the, the competition tanks blowing up uh, uh, from the similar from the very simple stuff like landmines or cluster munition on the front line. And I, I can imagine general dynamics designers or challenger designers how they're showing fingers to to leopard and said, "Oh, German technology technology is not it's not really good as as they pre- present." Uh, so it will be a, a lot of a lot of analysis after it. Of course, bottom line, money. Who is going to sell more of, the, of those equipment? Market economy. <laughs> yeah, market, it's yeah. market economy, <laughs> exactly. Right, okay. Yeah. Um, let's, co- uh, let's come to the last, uh, last two questions. Um, and uh, let me see. Yeah, recently there were uh, reports of a call up of some 3000 American troops. Um, can you explain technically what actually happened and what to make out of this? Uh, where will these guys be deployed and what are the implications? Scott, what do you think? The United States has something uh, I believe they call Atlantic Resolve. This is the um, the, the permanent uh, exercise. It's 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 a rotation. Basically, it started as simply rotating a heavy brigade uh, into Europe uh, that would 
rotate into Europe for a fixed period of time. I think it's a six month rotation. I could be wrong on that. They may have extended it. I don't know, uh, but it's there for a fixed amount of time. It's not a permanent deployment of these forces. And they generally, when they arrive, they do a show of force. They break up into company sized elements and they go train with the Balts and they train with the Poles. Some of them go down and train with the Romanians and the Bulgarians. And so the brigade disperses. It's not a combat fist. It's not a combat force. But as the situation in Ukraine developed, uh, they, they brought in a second brigade. Now, if you take a look at the U.S. Army, it's not what it used to be. And we only have a limited number of heavy brigades. And those heavy brigades have competing requirements. Uh, for instance, in the Middle East, um, in, in Korea, uh, they're, they're there. So when you, when you commit to a two-brigade rotation into, um, in, into Europe, um, and you have to start rotating through south. So while I have two brigades there, I have to identify two brigades back in the United States are going to replace them. They have to begin their, their train up, their build up to get everything ready. Um, and I got to put two other brigades on notice because as soon as these guys deploy in, they move up and they got to start getting ready. We, we, we're out of brigades. That's what's happening. We're out of brigades. So what they're doing is they're changing Atlantic Resolve from one status to another status. Uh, it went from being sort of a peacetime deployment to a wartime contingency. It's changed the, the political reality of this. So now, because it's now a wartime contingency or an operational contingency, A, the military is always happy about this, <laughs> get a campaign. Okay, so you're going <laughs> to, all the guys that are going there are going to come out. With the <laughs> yeah, they're going to they're gonna be able to say, I was in Poland <laughs> and the girls are going to go, Oh, marry me. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, so they, th th that's why they went, you know, also, you know, Napoleon said guys will die for a little piece of ribbon. Um, right. so it, it's changed that. So now, you know, guys are looking at their careers and instead of saying, I'm going to go to Europe for six months and not all I'm going to get out of it is, a uh, is, a is, 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 a uh, you know, OER, uh, you know, evaluation report. Now they're going to say, Nope, I'm going to get deployment credit. I'm going to get bling. I'm going to, you know, when I walk around now, I got stuff on my chest that says I was there um, and, and all that kind of stuff. So there's that. But it also allows the president now to call up reservists. Um, and so what the president is doing is he's calling up 3,000 uh, guys from the individual ready reserve and from the select military reserve. Um, now, I don't think this is a brigade. I don't think he's activated a, 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 a unit. I don't know, though. Uh, it, it sounds to me that he's, he's activating uh, people that go into the uh, support. Because when you get to the individual ready reserve, I used to, I, one of my jobs before I got out of the Marine Corps forever was I managed Marine Corps reserve manpower, intelligence manpower um, in New Orleans. And I know the difference between SMR and IIR in terms of what it means. And um, the, the, the individual ready reserve, when you mobilize them, you're mobilizing specialists. You're mobilizing people with a very specific skill set. Uh, usually they mirror image something in, um, you know, in, in, in Europe. So we had a lot of IIR guys going to Europe and, and, and doing six month deployments to, to, to fill a very specific um, skill set needed in the higher headquarters there. I think what's happening, and again, I don't know because I'm not getting, I think that the core level force and division level forces that are being sent to Poland are being staffed up. I think they're being made into something bigger uh, because the United States is committing to a more robust presence. And so these 3,000 people are the individuals and select specialist units needed to turn the cadre headquarters that they have for fifth corps mm -hmm. and maybe even for the division into fully staffed things to be prepared to receive mm -hmm. um, a, a fly in. Because remember, we've also built in Poland the prepositioned brigade structure. And I think we have one, one brigade worth there. Yeah, one. So, mm -hmm. so we have two brigades deployed. We have a striker brigade out of Germany there. Uh, we have some artillery units there and we have a fly in unit. So I and I believe we have an aviation brigade there as well. So we have the makings of a division plus deployment, which needs a core level headquarters. 
and that headquarters has to be fully functional. So I think what we're seeing, because remember, the United States, when we went into our brigade level stuff, we stopped doing cores. Right. We got them there, but they're in cadre status. We stopped fully manning a core. We barely man a division anymore. It's all the brigade is the element. That's where the decisions are made. Um, the brigade and the supported command, but all that stuff in the between, the division, the core, we don't fully man those anymore. So what I think is happening is that we're beefing up the core, the fifth core, that headquarters that's permanently assigned to Poland right now, and we're beefing up the fly-in division staff because with that brigade that came in came a division staff from the supported division. They went in there, and I think we're going to beef these two elements up along with the, for instance, you need a theater logistics command. I don't know what the Army calls their uh, logistics. Mm -hmm. Marine Corps would be the, the combat service support unit. Um, mm -hmm. But the, the Army needs the same thing. A transportation command has yeah. to be yeah. And so that's what I think these 3,000 are doing. 3,000 is not enough for a brigade. Mm -hmm. And to, to mobilize a, a, a National Guard or a, uh, or a uh, reserve brigade for Europe, um, you have to pull them out. You have to put them through a training rotation. You have to send them to the National Training Center. They have mm -hmm. to be certified. And then you have to get them and their equipment to Europe. That's yeah. a big pain in the butt. Uh, yeah. It's much better to uh, use these the, these IRRs and the SMR, Select Military Reserves, to send them in to beef up these headquarters for the potential of reinforcement, mm -hmm. which is, I think, what they're doing. They're sending a signal to NATO that America is leaning forward prepared to activate a division plus element in Poland in case the war spins out of yeah. control. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. I, I, I agree with you, Scott, because it's uh, selected people, people with certain specialities will go there to prepare the terrain for the for the rest to come in the most, most simplified way. In Canada, we have something similar, you know, it, it, uh, for instance, the reserve brigades, uh, uh, they're just, just a core, uh, core manpower. So in the case the Canada will participate in, in this kind of let's say I think Canada is active in, in Lithuania or Latvia some of the, some of those two countries uh, like a thousand people or fifteen hundred people so it's basically a little bit reinforced uh, battalion but with the core people that, that they can also do some rotations if necessary but it's more more political um, show to, for for the allies potential allies especially those about uh, in Poles Romanians or Bulgarians who are physically exposed because they're 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 first to the, the to the potential uh, uh, front line so a show of solidarity which is something that um, nato nato is doing all the time uh, and a uh, little bit put some little bit of experience uh, with the people and of course guys will put some medals campaign medals on their chest and brag about that but it will be all for the for the uh, for the piece of plot. Uh, nothing else is going to change in their civilian life when they when they come back because companies companies what they want they want people to work for to make profit for the company not to to make profit for the for the government yeah yeah okay uh thank you for that i've uh, you answered my both last questions so i think um uh, my my questions are done but i want to gi give both of you uh, a few minutes um i know mike is uh, currently in the process of publishing a new book right do you want to say a few words about that yeah, actually, I, I finished two books and sent two, two manuscripts to the publisher, uh, Frontline Books in UK. It's about uh, Russian um, air defense uh, systems, history, retrospective, everything characteristics, and the other thing is uh, rockets and missiles over Ukraine. And everything that is, uh, or let's say majority, 99% of the stuff that is in use from MLRS, uh, they launched the stuff, uh, Kinjal. So yeah, it's it's, it's pretty pretty busy time uh, working on that, but it, it's challenging. And uh, I'm working also on other proposal that will be the first book about Russian systems is called um, Defending Putin's uh, Empire. It was a uh, title chosen by the by the publisher, but now I want to propose the title Defending Zelensky's Empire because it will talk about Ukrainian air defense and especially that uh, critical stuff. How Patriot can engage Kinjal? Is it really physically possible to do, or is it just uh, just the stories? And I want to put a clear difference. What is the what is the might? What is the expectation and what is the reality? So yeah, it's uh, it's interesting stuff. We are living in an interesting time, and it should be put on the paper. Yeah, great. Uh, yeah. I will put um, the information on mm -hmm. on my Substack, of course. Mm -hmm. And um, Scott, I, uh, I I saw you published um, 
uh, video of Agent Zelensky and I watched the first part mm. and it was mm. uh, really great. Um, I didn't know many of these facts. Uh, do you want to tell our public a little bit about this movie? Uh, what triggered you to do this and where do you have the information from and so on? Um, it, it is very interesting. I will put it also on my Substack. Well, before we do that, though, Mike, I'm the inquiring public. How do I buy your books? <laughs> Oh, they, they will be uh, published. Uh, this two will be published in uh, one in September. Other is in uh, will go in October. So Amazon. it's now it's uh, no, it will be on Amazon, but it's going through the frontline books. There, there are some pre-orders. But you know what? I can I can send you when I get my copies. I will. Uh, I can send you. No, no, no. I'm going to buy copy. them. I I support authors by buying yeah. their books. So. Yeah, uh, me too. So I'm going to buy your books too. So okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, okay, it's, it's you. I mean, so. Yeah. So yeah. So it will be it will be uh, on Amazon, of course, and it will be through the frontline books uh, in UK. Okay. It, now the first thing is like a hardcover, but later it will be um, EPUBs, uh, e uh, ebooks, and uh, I guess later it will go with the uh, with the soft cover. Soft oh, got to get the hardcover, yeah. man. Hardcover. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, I mean, it's hardcover is really return really, for the author. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, Mike, okay. uh, as yeah. soon as it is published, I will buy it as well. Uh, I yeah. hope it Thank will be guys. shipped to Europe. <laughs> no, they, 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 they will be printed in Europe. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, yeah, they will be printed in in Europe because UK. Uh, they will be printed in uh, yeah. UK. Uh, one, I think, is 30th of September, uh, another is the 30th of October. Just just some tentative dates. Uh, that's something that they, uh, they told me. Yeah, no, that's great. I, I can't wait yeah. to read it. Uh, okay, then okay, back to I'm you, Scott. Uh, an agent Zelensky. Look, yeah. I've I've made a documentary film before. I made a film called uh, "In Shifting Sands." Um, I was the producer, the director, the writer, mm -hmm. uh, the whole the whole shebang. Um, and um, and so I know about how to make a documentary film. Um, on this one, a, uh, Agent Z, Agent Zelensky. Um, I was approached by an independent um, a documentary film company, and they had an idea. And I, I, so I, I was pitched and um, I was pitched to be the talent and to be uh, participating in the quality control of it, so to speak. But I, you know, I have to be just straight up honest that um, I didn't conceive this project. Uh, it was pitched to me. I, I read the, the pitch and I said, yeah, I'd like to be a part of this. I, I can do this. Um, so we, we discussed um, sources. Uh, you know, where the sources of information would come from. I reviewed them. Um, some that I felt uh, were, you know, a little too conspiratorial uh, were dropped. Others that I wasn't aware of uh, was brought in. So I, I can't claim that I am the, the bottomless knowledge pit of, uh, of Zelensky's background. I, I did watch Servant of the People, and um, I, I'm aware of that. I've, I've done a lot of research yeah. into uh, Zelensky. I'm aware in, in the new information that came to me. I, I read it. I studied it to make sure that it, it was it was good. We discussed um, who would be best uh, to uh, collaborate. And what I mean by that is uh, we interviewed a lot of people for this. And uh, so we discussed, you know, who, who could be interviewed, um, what questions would be asked. Um, and then, you know, they have a production team that goes around and interviews people. I didn't go and interview all these people. Um, I was in Russia for a lot of this, uh, you know, doing my, my book tour there. So they, you know, we, we had people do it, but then, then, Based upon the answers we got to the questions we asked, then a script sort of writes itself. You you have to you know you have to line up the interviews and then you have to fill it in. And so you prepare a script, and that was a collaborative effort. Um, and at the end of the day, we did that, and I sat down and I um, I did what all talent does, and I read from a teleprompter. Te from a teleprompter, <laughs> uh, I never do. Uh, and so it was a it was a different. There was many takes because. Um, yeah not comfortable with that but i i you know when i say i read from a teleprompter it's not that wasn't the first time i saw the script i mean i was familiar with the script i'm just not used to the process of i'm an impromptu speaker and so how do you read from a teleprompter but make it sound like you're being impromptu a uh, big challenge but uh to the credit of the uh of this production company they were able to take all of these parts and put them together uh in a very professional film and uh, part one of the film was published last week, and part two is coming out today. In fact, it should be out very soon. Mm, okay. um, I'm going to watch this. <laughs> I think yeah. it's a, I think it's a very important film because, you know, one of the reasons why I'm enthusiastic about the project and that that I I I, I uh, allowed myself to be a part of this project 
is that, you know, my country right now is in the process of, you know, spending billions of dollars in supporting Ukraine. Um, and one of the way, one of the things that's done to sell this is that Zelensky is sold as one of us, uh, a man who's democratic at the core. He's fighting for freedom. He's fighting our values. Our values are projected onto Zelensky. Um, he's been, you know, portrayed as the modern day Winston Churchill. He is the wartime leader and all this kind of stuff. And I just think it's imperative that if we are going to support Ukraine, at least we'd be honest about what we're supporting. Uh, we have to call it spade a spade. And so part one of the uh, film was about educating people about the, you know, who Zelensky is, where he came from, um, where his basis of support is, et cetera. And I think it's imperative that people know that. And part two is more about who he works for, because uh, understand that Zelensky is a tool. He's not, you know, he's not the leader. He's not the one calling the shots. He's a tool being used by other forces. And those other forces are foreign intelligence services, primarily the British and the Americans. And so the, this this film does that. But the whole idea of the film, and this is what I encourage people to to do, um, it's it's a counter narrative, meaning that, uh, you know, if you if you want to research Zelensky today, um, and I point this out that a lot of the original stuff has been, you know, search engines have been manipulated. It's very f difficult to find some of the uh, more damning, uh, you know, information that detracts from Zelensky. Most of the stuff that goes to the top of the search engine is stuff designed to promote the Zelensky image, mm -hmm. to promote him as a wartime leader, as a defender of democracy, et cetera. Um, and people are out there, you know, let's say they have a question. Why are we doing this? And they, and they search. They get an answer, and it's not the right answer. My job isn't to shape, isn't to tell you what to think. And this film isn't designed to make anybody. To, I'm not saying it's this or nothing. What I'm saying is, here's a counter argument. Here's countervailing information. You should watch this to empower yourself with knowledge and information. Not because I'm telling you what to think or how to think, but I'm exposing you to alternative information that hopefully you engage the supercomputer that's between this earlobe and this earlobe, and you make a determination, which fact set do you believe? Um, which, you know, and, and we have worked hard to make sure that the fact set that's produced, that's contained in these videos is unassailable. Um, you know, that, that it's a solid fact set, uh, that you can rely upon this fact set. But I'm not saying you have to do that. I'm saying I want you to watch this I want you to start thinking more critically about who this man is, whom we're putting everything behind in a cause that may end up promoting a thermonuclear war with Russia that will kill us all. So is this worth it? Is supporting Zelensky, is Zelensky worth the potential destruction of mankind? And so this film is supposed to get you to think about that. And I was very proud to be a part of this. Yeah, of course, it is very important and I watched it and uh, I learned a lot and it, ca it caused me to think about um, f um, former events, not only about the future, but what happened in the past. And that's very important. That's uh, why I will put it on my sub stack so everyone can uh, watch yeah, it. Thank I, you. I, my, my wife and I, um, I get in trouble a lot because um, I, I like to watch movies. And um, but I'm the kind of guy that when I watch a movie, I say, I want to see that again. Why? Because I missed something. Because mm -hmm. the first time you see it, it's the first time you're seeing a movie. So you're you're watching it. So I, I have to go see it again. She's like, I'm not seeing that movie again. I said, I have to. <laughs> and then I, I see it and I go, oh, I learned mm -hmm. something new there. And then I see it again. I go, oh, I learned something new there. So that's why I've watched Maverick Top Gun six times. I've watched, <laughs> uh, you know, um, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood about six times. Uh, yeah. Gardens of the Galaxy three times, maybe a fourth coming up because I learned something new every time. Uh, <laughs> You know, Mission Impossible just came out, so I'm going to have to see it again. But the reason why I bring that up is that um, Servant of the People, I watched it when 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 mm -hmm. the Zelensky phenomena first happened, uh, yeah. available on Netflix, and I watched it. It was fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Zelensky is a very, very good actor. I'll give him all the credit in the world. He yeah. does a yeah. great job. Yeah, and whoever yeah. wrote that and produced that, the production values are good. The script writing was genius. It was entertaining. But I watched it from the perspective of somebody just watching, like, The West Wing, you know, an American politicized drama. <laughs> yeah. 
and I watched it. And I'm like, oh, okay. But now, after I did the, you know, got involved in the research for this thing, when I watched it again, it's a totally different show. Yeah. Because now you're sitting there going, this is deliberate. Yeah. This is conditioning of a public. This mm -hmm. is a psychological operation. This isn't entertainment. This is the manipulation of a population. And this is serious, guys, because it worked. It worked. This is one of the most successful um, psychological operations, one of the successful mass manipulations of modern history. Modern history, yeah. You need to know about that because if it can be done there, think about what it can be done to anywhere else. Think about the next time you turn on a major TV production, what it is they're trying to uh, tell you. When you watch a movie, Zero Dark Thirty comes to mind, of the CIA, that the CIA participated in the production of. Um, mm -hmm. Are you watching entertainment or are you being manipulated? And mm -hmm. that's one of the amazing takeaways from this, this, uh, this film is the way the servant of the people was a massive psychological operation designed to get the Ukrainian people to put this man in office to do a job. That's yeah. the thing. He wasn't there to do what he said. He's there to do a job. I'll tell you, I'll save what the job is for part two of the documentary. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Scott, you are unfair because uh, you produced a cliffhanger. <laughs> so. It's coming out today. It's coming out. Yeah. Today. yeah. We are we are all sitting in front of the TV and <laughs> no, but uh, what you just said means uh, that this operation is um, planned for at least uh, uh, for the last 10 years and that's why yeah. I said um, the past is now more interesting than mm -hmm. than, the, than the future. Yeah. It's, it's very interesting. Okay, so we, we came to the end. Thank you uh, very much, both. It was a great Pleasure. interview. And I hope we will do this again. Uh, right. yeah. Well, thank you very much, Alex. Thank you. Thanks, thanks for having me. And thank you, guys. Yeah, good time. Thank okay. you, guys. It was excellent. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Bye. Okay.